Without it, there's no unity. Without it, there's no confession of wrongs. Without it, there's no outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We're talking about humility today, and I want to welcome you to day seven of our 10 days of discovery in the upper room. Those 10 days transformed the disciples from narcissistic, egocentric megalomaniacs to humble, teachable, and self-sacrificing workers for Jesus. Let's join Dr. Ella Simmons as she shares this important message on sacrificial humility. Sacrificial humility. What is this phenomenon and is it necessary in today's world? And if so, how does one acquire it? Let's explore. On January 5, 1948, a commemorative postage stamp was issued by the United States Postal Service in honor of the life and accomplishments of George Washington Carver. Carver was born around the year 1864, a sickly baby boy to slave parents and was orphaned almost immediately. But this baby boy survived and went on to distinguish himself as a brilliant scientist and a prolific inventor. He received many awards throughout his life, including a coin in his name, a monument, and a submarine, all named for him. He is most noted for his work in agricultural science, resulting in hundreds and hundreds of uses for the peanut and sweet potato. History reports that although Carver received many prestigious awards and honors and was sought after by political leaders and royalty, he remained the same in humble temperament and commitment to sacrificial living. C.S. Lewis made an insightful observation about human nature in this regard. He said, there is one vice of which no man in the world is free, which everyone in the world loathes when he sees it in someone else, and of which hardly any people except Christians ever imagine that they are guilty themselves. He said, I have heard people admit that they are bad tempered or that they cannot keep their heads about girls or men or drink, or even that they are cowards. I do not think, he said, I have ever heard anyone who was not a Christian accuse himself of this vice. And at the same time, I have very seldom met anyone who was not a Christian who showed the slightest mercy to it in others. There is no fault which makes a man more unpopular and no fault which we are more unconscious of in ourselves. And the more we have it ourselves, the more we dislike it in others. The vice I am talking of, Lewis asserted, is pride or self-conceit. And he went on to say, the virtue opposite to it in Christian morals is called humility. The disciples' attitude before Pentecost were dramatically different from their attitudes after Pentecost. 10 days in the upper room made a remarkable difference. Luke's gospel notes that shortly before Jesus' death, there was also rivalry among them, the disciples, as to which of them should be considered the greatest. This certainly does not sound like the description of a group of men who were called to model Christ's love in the cities and towns where they were called to reach people, the people who needed to hear this message, the message of the cross. It does not seem like a community of believers who could be trusted with the Holy Spirit's power to turn the world upside down with their preaching. Personal ambitions dominated their thinking. 
motivated by self-interest, they were much more interested in what they would receive from following Christ than giving themselves in selfless service. They were confident that they were ready to rule with Christ in his coming kingdom, and each longed for preeminence. Peter's confidence overflowed as he brashly uttered that he was willing to go both to prison and death for Christ. In fact, according to Matthew's gospel, all of the disciples expressed the same arrogant, self-confident attitude. Peter assured Jesus, he said, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. In striving for first place, these disciples fail to understand the essence of the gospel. They seemed deaf to Jesus' words. Whoever desires to be first among you, Jesus said, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Pentecost made all the difference. During the 10 days in the upper room, the disciples carefully examined their own hearts. They understood their own weaknesses and pleaded for his strength. They recognized their selfishness and pleaded for the humble, selfless spirit of Jesus. Describing their experience, Ellen White states, as the disciples waited for the fulfillment of the promise, they humbled their hearts in true repentance and confessed their unbelief. As they called to remembrance the words that Christ had spoken to them before his death, they understood more fully their meaning. Truths which had passed from their memory were again brought to their minds, and these they repeated to one another. They reproached themselves for their misapprehension of the Savior. Like a procession, scene after scene of his wonderful life passed before them. As they meditated upon his holy life, they felt that no toil would be too hard, no sacrifice too great. If only, if only they could bear witness in their lives to the loveliness of Christ's character. Oh, oh, they thought if they could but have the past three years to live over again, how differently they would act. As the disciples prayed together, humbling their hearts before God, the Holy Spirit brought to their minds the lessons of humility, trust, submission, and service that Christ had so longed for them to understand. The disciples felt rebuked by the convinc convicting and convincing power of the Holy Spirit. They wished they could live the last three and a half years over again. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever wished you could just go back and correct your past mistakes? The Holy Spirit not only convicts us of sin, he heals our broken hearts. He brings us hope. He assures us that God has a better plan for our lives. He inspires us with promises of a better future. Take Peter, for example. After Pentecost, he was a totally changed person. Filled with the Holy Spirit, he preached a powerful sermon on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 people were baptized in one day. When the Jewish authorities attempted to silence his witness, he 
fearlessly exclaimed, we cannot but speak the things we have seen and heard. The boastful Peter had become confident, not in himself, however, but in the strength of the Lord. The arrogant Peter had learned the lesson of humble, selfless service. Listen to his own testimony. He said, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, Peter said, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Humble hearts are hearts that God can fill with his spirit. They are hearts that are open to receive God's richest blessing. Consider Jesus. The Savior left the glories of heaven to come to this sinful world. He left the fellowship of the Father, the adoration of angels, and the worship of heavenly beings. The Apostle Paul describes Jesus' experience in these words. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Jesus not only became a man, he became a servant. He not only became a servant, he became an obedient servant. He not only became an obedient servant, but he was obedient unto death. He not only died, but he died the most horrible death of all, the death of the cross. Christ's complete submission to God's will, will even to his death on the cross, qualified him to become our high priest in heaven above, seated at the right hand of God. Humble obedience always precedes greatness. God exalts those who bow low in humility. Humility is an attitude of loving service that does not inflate one's importance. It is constantly concerned about the needs of others. In the humble heart, self is not the center of the universe. Humility leads us to be Christ-centered and others-focused. This focus, then, is on giving, not getting. It drives us to be concerned about others. It desires only good for others and does not use them to accomplish its own ends. Humility is one of the characteristics that God values most. Let's consider three passages of scripture and prayerfully reflect on the implications for living a life of sacrificial humility. Let nothing be done, the word says, through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. What does it mean to esteem each other better than themselves? It does not mean to totally neglect self, but rather to look out for others. Carver is said to have developed a set of rules for living that reflect this perspective. He said, be clean both inside and out. Neither look up to the rich nor down on the poor. 
lose, if need be, without squealing, without complaining, win without bragging. Always be considerate of women, children, and older people, those who often do not have a voice. He said, be too brave to tell a falsehood. Be too generous to cheat. Take your share of the world and let others take theirs. Then what is lowliness of mind? What is this phenomenon? How can we put on lowliness of mind? Scripture equates lowliness of mind to humbleness, meekness, submissiveness, and modesty. Having a humble opinion of oneself. Romans 12 tells us that we should shed light on how you can put on the lowliness of mind. If we study the scripture, we will understand this, Romans is saying. It says that you must allow yourselves to be changed by presenting your bodies as living sacrifices, holy, acceptable to God. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then why is humility so important in receiving the latter rain? The latter rain, let's explore. God wants to do extraordinary things for and through his people in these last days to qualify for these extraordinary gifts that God wants to shower upon us, you must humble yourself. You must be willing to sacrifice. Scripture speaks of the extraordinary empowerment as the outpouring of the early and latter rain. Over the coming days, ask God to give you a humble spirit Plead with him to take all pride out of your heart. Seek to have a mind filled with the desire to serve others. Give God permission to take all selfishness and greed out of your heart. The Holy Spirit may reveal some things that you may not want to face, but let him do it. He may reveal pride selfish ambition, a competitive spirit, or the desire for preeminence. If he does, open your heart to the cleansing power of Jesus and remember that God humbles us before he fills us. He often brings us low before he exalts us. It is true that in the time of the end, when God's work in the earth is closing, the earnest efforts put forth by consecrated believers under the guidance of the Holy Spirit are to be accompanied by special tokens of divine favor. Under the figure of the early and latter rain that falls in eastern lands at seed time and harvest, the Hebrew prophets foretold the bestowal of spiritual grace in extraordinary measure upon God's church. The outpouring of the Spirit in the days of the apostles was the beginning of the early or former rain, and glorious was the result. To the end of time, the presence of the Spirit is to abide with the true church. But near the close of earth's harvest, a special bestowal of spiritual grace is promised to prepare the church for the coming of the Son of Man. This outpouring of the Spirit is likened to the falling of the latter rain. And it is for this added power that Christians are to send their petitions to the Lord of the harvest in the time of the latter rain. In response, the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain. He will cause to come down the rain, the former rain and the latter rain. Throughout history, 
God has used people who have humbled their hearts before him. When God finds people more interested in his glory than in their own, he uses them mightily for the advancement of his kingdom. As the disciples humbled their hearts before his throne, confessing their sins and committing themselves to do his will, they experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in abundant measure. What a privilege. What an opportunity. What possibilities. God longs to pour out his Holy Spirit in latter rain power upon his church today. Do you want to partake in that type of outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Will you open your heart right now and ask God if there is anything in your life that would keep you from receiving the fullness of his spirit today? He will answer. This 10 days in the upper room has been such a blessing, including today's presentation on sacrificial humility. I'm happy that we have Dr. Gerald Klingbaugh with us today to share mm. an experience in your own life uh, how God's taught you about sacrifice and humility. Mm. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much, Derek. I appreciate the invitation. Uh, when I thought about sacrificial humility, somehow I thought humble people don't talk about humility. <laughs> um, Jesus gave us the perfect example. You know, he left aside everything and he went into a cross-cultural new world. And somehow that reminded me, us, uh, reminded me of our experience when we left about 17 years ago, my wife and I, with our children, um, I had just finished my PhD, left for South America, and wanting to serve the Lord as a teacher. It, it was a wonderful experience. We were treated well. We had to study Spanish in about four months. You know, I had to learn to be able to teach in Spanish, which was stressful. But somehow, we always felt there was a barrier. There was a barrier between my students, between our, uh, our friends in, in Peru and, and ourselves. Until the day that we announced that we were awaiting uh, a baby. Chantal was pregnant. We were so excited. We had waited quite, quite a while. We were very excited about that. And the whole campus shared our joy. It's a fairly big campus, about 1,800, 2,000 students at that time. And people were really excited. Children are very important in, in South America. And then three months later, one Sabbath morning, Chantal uh, felt pain. And we rushed her to the hospital mm. and we lost that baby. Mm -hmm. I still remember somehow how I couldn't understand. We were far away. We didn't have a community, uh, we didn't have a family support close by. And we cried and cried, both Chantal and I. And in that moment, God opened the doors to the hearts of our Peruvian brothers and sisters. They could somehow see that, yeah, this pain makes them as we are. They're not, you know, foreigners. They're not um, better educated or coming from a first world country, coming to, going to a third world country. And that opened the door for me to learn, to humbly learn also from my students, from the parishioners that we served, from my brothers and sisters in Peru. Somehow that reminds me every time when I think about humility and I think about Jesus leaving heaven, it reminds me of, of, of that experience. Just uh, being willing to be open about your pain, about your challenge, uh, to yeah. accept support? To accept support, but also to somehow get invited into, the, into their hearts. That was mm -hmm. they, I think that was a crucial moment, and God was very good. Um, I still don't know. I would have loved to, to see that wonderful child, but God gave us three more children, and uh, we were very blessed in our six years in Peru. Do you look at that sacrifice as a, a loss? Uh, you, you gave of your life there. Uh, how do you look back on that experience? I think every person that goes into a different culture, a different place, 
gives something. There's sacrifice involved. But I don't feel it's a sacrifice. I received so much in return. Uh, this year, I went back to Peru with my whole family. And it was just a wonderful experience to see my former students leading out in the church, being professors, pastors, conference presidents, and just being enwrapped by their warmth and love. It's, it, it was amazing. You know, it truly is amazing when we, when we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, yes. that He will lift us up. And it sounds that as you look back, you can thank God, even through that experience of sacrifice mm -hmm. and humility, that God taught you a powerful lesson. Definitely, definitely. Well, we're so glad that you are with us for this 10 days in the upper room. So many lessons that we can learn for our lives today. And I want to pray that God would bless you as you listen to his voice and you understand what it means to humble yourself, to follow the example of Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you that as we humble ourselves before you, that you will lift us up in due time, that you love us and that you'll bless us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for that personal testimony. You know, humility is one of those things that just can't be faked. It's a quality that is self-ignorant, for if we know that we're humble, we most likely really aren't. It's like the saying, I used to be a very proud person, but I turned out all right after all. Once again, we have to realize that humility just isn't something we can have on our own. We won't get it from self-help books or classes. We won't even get it from going to church. We only experience true sacrificial humility through the power and the grace of Jesus Christ. It comes as we spend time with him and see how he, though a king of the universe, became a servant and died the most humbling death, even the death of the cross. It comes as we honestly begin to examine ourselves, confess our faults, and realize our daily, moment-by-moment -moment need of divine grace. I don't know about you, friend, but I want this experience. I want to, as Paul put it, have the mind of Christ in me. Is this your desire? Would you join me in asking the Lord to give us this experience? Father in heaven, today we realize that we can't be humble on our own. We realize that nothing we can do can develop this character trait in us. Only a miracle of your spirit. Only by spending time with you and, and seeing the humility and the grace and the love of Jesus. And so today, Father, we just want to give you our hearts once again. We want to ask you to change those hearts. Change the pride into humility. Ta change our stubbornness into willingness and change us into the disciples, the modern day disciples that you want us to be. This is our prayer. This is our desire in Jesus' name.